You're listening to the Mind Your Business Podcast, episode number 80. Today, we're talking all about our core beliefs, what they are, and how to change them. So, stay tuned. Hi, I'm James Wedmore, and I've built a seven-figure internet business that offers the financial freedom to do what I want, when I want. And I'm the first to say that hard work and hustle are not essential ingredients for your success. So how do you build a thriving business from the inside out? This is the Mind Your Business podcast featuring myself and co-host Phoebe Morocek. All right. Hello, everyone. James Wedmore here. And I'm Phoebe Morocek. And welcome to the Mind Your Business podcast. podcast. What's the name of your podcast? Mind your business. Mind your business. Well, excuse me. Sorry for asking. (laughs) This is a a wonderful interview episode that Phoebe and I just wrapped up that we were so excited about. And now we're just kind of standing here looking at the completion of this interview. So this is with Dr. Michaela Sarno. We'll get into her intro in a moment. But just looking at it being finished, Phoebe, what are your thoughts? I feel like my mind is blown. I don't know. I was just sitting here after we hung up with her. I was like, <laughs> you were, you were kind of out of it. I'm like, yeah. is every, did you not like the episode? <laughs> I was like, no, it was just really, really good. <laughs> there were just so many pieces that, I mean, I feel like even after we hung up with her, she's like, oh my gosh, I could go on for days. I was like, well, I could listen to you talk for days Yes, because it was just so fascinating and so intertwined with what I'm going through at the moment. And as she's talking, I'm like, yes, I wanted to be like, preach so many times Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it's just, it is mind blowing what she's able to accomplish and just seeing, you know, and hearing about your transformation, James is really inspiring. And, you know, along my journey, I can just see where this would totally fit in. Yeah. So I tell a little bit of the story in the episode. I won't spoil it here of how I found Dr. Michaela, but the long story short is that I hired her for a five day intensive and it really is intense. I came to her office every day for five days, just a couple of weeks ago is the beginning of the year. It was intense. So I actually stayed at a hotel while it happened and I didn't work. And it was emotional. There was crying. <laughs> there was like reflecting. There was moments of like where I felt like I was like the character in Catcher in a Rye where you're just mm. like walking around like questioning everything. And like you're just going, I was going through this journey and I came out the other side and it was beautiful. And it really was transformational on a level that I hadn't experienced yet. And I have done other personal development programs and transformational work. And it was just absolutely extraordinary. And it doesn't even matter what I say, because it doesn't do it justice until you experience this for yourself. And so the best way, you know, because Phoebe's been asking me every day since she's been down here, like, so so tell me, what was it like? Mm -hmm. What is the transformation? And I think the only thing I can really say is that a lot of the personal development work that we tend to do is to get you to like create more discipline when you have a negative habit, like train yourself, like don't do that, you know? So like if something bugs you and upsets you and you get, let's say triggered, you know, something causes you to be upset. There's a lot of work that you can do to like create some space between the reaction and the stimuli or your reaction to that stimuli, you know, create some space or like take a deep breath or like, you know, write it down and put it in your drawer and all these things that it's like to let the boiling of your blood simmer down because you're angry or you're frustrated or you're upset. And so we do a lot of work in those areas and I'm really trying to work on, you know, having more positive thoughts and not thinking so negatively. And what this work does is not that. You just find out at the other end that the thing that used to trigger you just no longer triggers you. Like, it just doesn't affect you. And wow, like that was just unbelievable. And if you can imagine what that would be like, if something that was normally an upset for you is just no longer an upset. It's no longer an issue or a problem, so you don't need to do any work on how you react to it. That's life-changing. And you will find in this episode how that is possible, I hope, that Mm -hmm. we begin a foundationary conversation into where these upsets and triggers 
come from and how we can begin to heal that instead of creating all these things on top, which is what I feel like is most motivational and personal development type stuff, which is why it doesn't last. You have to have all this discipline and it's like this veneer and this fake smile. And it's what we call putting whipped cream on garbage where, you know, where people like to criticize the positive thinking is it is, it's like whipped cream on garbage because if underneath it all is the antithesis to that, to the opposite of that, then what work are we really doing? It sounds like a lot of work for very little payoff. And here we just got to the source of it. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. And in, I think in this interview, for me, it was looking at it. At the end of the interview, you're not going to be like, oh, perfect. I'm healed. I'm cured. <laughs> All of this. It was just opening the conversation. Yeah. And but really- what she did say, you asked this question was like, so what is the work? And she was. She was like, step one is you have to have an acknowledgement of these truths. Yep. I couldn't agree more. And then she'll kind of tell you what the work is as well. So pretty powerful. No, extremely powerful. Yeah. It really was. And going through it and just hearing some of her language is just not language I'm used to, which Mm. is really exciting because sometimes you just hear the same things over and over and you're like, yep, got that. But what does that mean? Or got that. Okay. And you kind of tune out. This one, I was so tuned in (laughs) throughout the whole thing that there were moments I forgot to talk. (laughs) It's like, oh my gosh. So my mind's blown. You're just like a listener. I was. So I hope everyone else's mind is going to get blown. Mm -hmm. Let's do a quick bio of Dr. Michaela. So Dr. Michaela Sarno is a licensed psychotherapist, a brain training and mindset expert, and an EMDR specialist, a brain training expert and creator of several online programs and guided courses to help people change their brain, to remove negative core beliefs, and to draw abundance in their lives. Awesome. So without further ado, let's play that interview with Dr. Michaela. All right, Dr. Michaela, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is really exciting, and I can't wait to get into both the experience that I had working with you one-on-one every day for five days. I've been telling people that you really put the word intense into intensive, (laughs) quite literally, but it was such a beautiful, extraordinary experience. And I just think for the past couple of weeks, all we've been wanting to do is get you on the show. And I know Phoebe's here. She's excited, right? I am excited. James called me and he's like, oh my gosh, guess what I'm doing? And I remember we were trying to schedule, I was trying to get some podcasts and recordings and he's like, nope, can't do it. I need the rest of the day to rest. I was like, what? What? (laughs) Who is this woman and what is she doing to James? And it was just so funny because he came back from it being like, you've got to do this. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then we alluded to you know, your session with Dr. Michaela on episode 71, The Power of Your Story. And that has turned out to be one of the biggest or most popular episodes that we've had in a while because it really forced, I mean, James and I were doing very similar work at the same time, which was very funny and synchronistic, but it was whatever you did really opened James up and allowed him to share so much more of his story on the podcast. And for that, I'm grateful. And I'm just so excited that you're here. You're like this mystery woman that I've been waiting to meet. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think this is a great place to start since I think a big piece of your message is the power and importance of your personal story and your journey. And you shared a lot of that with me. So I'd like to, to start there and just have you share a little bit of your story with our listeners and really why you do what you do. Well, it's a you know, great place to start and I'll try to make it short, you know, short and sweet, you know, and in essence, we all grow up with something and some more dysfunction than others. Most clinicians, psychotherapists, psychologists tend to grow up with dysfunction. But, you know, for me, there was, you know, I didn't even really know that I had much of a story probably five or six years ago. And I was asked to speak on stage at one of Shalene Johnson's events, Smart Success, I think 2013. And and she suggested sharing a few of my stories. She knows, you know, my entire background. And I was okay with that. I'm used to being on the other side and listening to other people's stories. That's what I do as a therapist. But I was willing because I wanted to use some of those stories, just little bits of them to prove a point. But you know, ultimately, I did not plan to be a psychologist. I I never, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't say when I grew up, I want to be a brain trainer or mindset expert, I wanted to be actually thought I was going to be the next Britney Spears. 
I wanted to be, you know, a singer. I was a musician. But I had grown up with, you know, all of these, all of this dysfunction. And ultimately, I had grown up with just tons and tons of lies. You know, everything that I ever had thought, I mean, my childhood was the kind of childhood you would see on Oprah. And, you know, what was really a consistent theme was everything I thought that was true would turn out to be a lie. Everywhere I thought I was going, I would find out I was being taken somewhere else. Everybody I knew and who I thought they were, I would find out they were someone else. It was just lie after lie after lie. And I had, you know, as I continued forward, you know, working on music and thinking that was going to be my, you know, my destiny, I always struggled with these lies in my head. And for a lot of us, we can jump through hoops, we can, you know, we can get degrees, we can do these things. But those lies, those thoughts about ourselves, you know, that we're not good enough, or that we're unworthy, or we tend to just push them aside, we ignore them, and we kind of white knuckle life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like that. I didn't really want to white knuckle it. And I was just unbelievably curious. And that's just my personality to understand why that happens. And how do we get rid of these ongoing thoughts that we have? Like, how can we feel as good in our lives and what we're doing to match some of these other feelings that just randomly come up in these thoughts. So I decided to, you know, focus on school. And once I really started, you know, diving into it, I started working with, you know, addicts. Um, I was an interventionist, started a business with Ken Seeley from the show Intervention. I worked with individuals who just got out of prison and I worked with, I was specialized with couples started working with trauma and really started looking at all the different therapies that there were. And I really, really wanted to just understand myself. That was my goal. I wanted to understand the people in my life and I wanted to figure out what was real. And I know that might sound funny, but for some, my reality had never been really shaped for me. And that's the job of our caregivers shape your reality. But my reality was never shaped. Everything was a lie consistently, if that makes sense. So I really wanted to understand so much. The more I took classes and started, you know, understanding psychology, the more I thought, well, this is definitely where my interest is. And upon doing that, I started studying, working with people. I started studying the brain and neuroscience because, you know, my curiosity was, okay, well, we're telling people these things. And it's no fun if someone leaves and they're happy, but they're only happy for a day or two. And then we're just really teaching them to manage their lives, just maintain it. That's not fun. Mm -hmm. So I started studying neuroscience and how the brain works. And that helped me understand a lot more because now I'm looking at a funnel. Where does it start? How do we change this? Where's the core? And I did that for a few years where I really implemented neuroscience and the brain and how this is working and everything dialed down to our core beliefs, what we believe about ourselves, you know, and I could talk for days on this, but upon doing that for a few years, I needed to find a specific modality and there's thousands of modalities with therapy. And, you know, I studied hypnosis, neurofeedback, you know, of course, cognitive behavioral therapy, you name it. And I came across a type of therapy called EMDR, which focuses specifically on core beliefs. So I thought, that, I thought this is it. And it was diving into the concept behind EMDR. It's an amazing tool. We can talk about it you know, later, but it was diving into the concept of core beliefs and how we can actually change them. And that's what I was looking for is how do we get rid of this so we don't have to live with it for the rest of our life. It seems unfair to survive certain things in our lives or overcome challenges. We don't have to have trauma. It could be anything. But it seems unfair to overcome it or survive it and then still have to live with it for the rest of your life. So after bringing in neuroscience, I really saw in my practice just a complete turnover, complete change. But after a few years, I started noticing that there was still something missing. And I realized that, you know, we talk a lot about the brain we definitely talk a lot about psychology. But why do we not talk about the mind and the psyche? And I think one of the reasons is, and you can cut in at any time, but one of the reasons is 
we don't really know a lot about the mind. Mm. It's most theory. But the one thing we do know is that the mind, the psyche, the personality, it's all the same thing, became aware of itself. And that was it for me, is I started studying the psyche and the self. And that's what brought me into more of a psychoanalytic perspective, which works with self states, and really starting to understand, okay, this is why we can think one thing and feel another, is we understand mindset as mindset's a state of mind. What we don't often share with people is that we don't just have one state of mind. We have many. And that's why we can look back in our lives and look back on events and we can logically know the answer to some of the questions to why things happened or to the whys. But yet we still have the thought of why. It doesn't go away. That doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense. If I know the answer, why do I still ask why to myself? So that's that battle that most people will understand, you know, the battle in your head where you know you can do something, but there's that other, you know, that other side of you that kind of tells you, I don't know, you can do this or, right. you know, that battle represents these different self states. Does that make sense? It does. And I'm really excited to dive into the self states and the core beliefs. I think that was, those were two things that just blew my mind over our five day intensive. But I, I, I got to share really quickly how we got connected because the story just makes me smile. And that was, I was at an amazing 10 course dinner with one of your past clients and he was sharing just like his history and his, in his story and his life. And I just remember I, I just stopped him and I just said like, I'm so impressed like to have the stuff that's happened in your life and the stuff that you've gone through, like, how are you such an awesome, amazing, like normal and super successful, mm -hmm. high performance individual? And he just said, oh, Dr. Michaela. <laughs> and that was like the answer. And that was obviously I was like, OK, wh what's her name? And, and like I'm Googling you two seconds later. But what was funny is he said, yes, yeah, she does EMDR. And I think the first thing I learned from you was that that it and I think you're already saying it here on the podcast is that's just this one piece of it. It's just one arrow in the quiver. And so what happened after our first day, as you'll remember and recall, is I went home and Googled EMDR. And like the first thing I learned about it was that it's for people suffering from PTSD. I went into this total breakdown into my head. Like, I don't have that. That's a meme. Is she wasting her time on mm. me? Am I just wasting a whole week of this person's life? I'm not one of these, you know, shouldn't she be working with those people? And I remember you came back and when I addressed that to you and clearly shared what you do. And I think that's where I'm getting to with my question is that it sounds like for the most part, you work with a very specific individual in very specific ways today. And I just want to make sure that that's brought out in the interview. So if you could answer, who do you love working with and what is really the transformation that you provide for them? Well, you know, that's a good, you know, good topic to address is a lot of people just assume, especially with EMDR and EMDR is, is just a portion. It's just a tool that I use, you know, alongside of, you know, other tools that I bring in, but, you know, I work with anybody, but specifically those who want, who desire, who really desire that change. So, you know, so I screen my clients. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, I have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of gurus, a lot of leaders, a lot of, you know, top coaches, but I also have a lot of, you know, moms, a lot of, you know, just your everyday average person who comes in and it doesn't matter if they're struggling with anxiety. It doesn't matter if they just feel like they wonder if they're self-sabotaging. doesn't matter if they just want to improve their confidence. It doesn't matter if they have intense trauma, no trauma. We're still dealing with one main subject, and that's our core beliefs. And after years and years of digging and digging and digging, I'm the kid that, you know, continuously asks, but why? Mm -hmm. But why? And after digging and digging and digging, it all continually kept coming down to our core beliefs. Can you touch on that? Because I, I think most people won't even know, well, what is a core belief? So, you know, in a nutshell, part of child development is when, you know, as we're growing, when we're really, really small, three, four, five, six, you know, we have to, for our survival, and this is an unconscious thing that happens, we have to always 
be defining ourselves to figure out what we are. So everything, every time something happens, the brain, especially during sleep, when we go to sleep at the end of the day, and this begins very early, when you're in REM sleep mode, your brain's sifting through everything that happens throughout the day. And it has to come to some sort of conclusion. What does this say about me? And again, it does that for your survival. But as children, little kids, adolescents, teens, the brain is doesn't have much logic. As a matter of fact, logic is dormant, that part of our brain, till the age of eight. But the brain still has to come up with a conclusion, what does this say about me? And so we end up filling in the gap with that. And those gaps can often be distortions. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you're in the third grade, you don't get invited to a, you know, a birthday party and everybody else in class does. So what does that say about me? Well, kids going to make sense of it as I must not be good enough or I must not be worthy or I don't matter. Mm -hmm. We take our feelings and we unconsciously define them. It's like branding the feeling. So for the rest of our life, every time that feeling comes back up, it's already been branded. That feeling means I don't matter. That feeling means I'm not capable. So our core beliefs are the things that we accept as truth. And that is always the underbelly of a feeling. It always, we, we brand our feelings. Does that answer your question in it, terms of it, where they come from? It absolutely does. And to offer almost too simplistic of an analogy, it's almost as if when you're a little kid and you learn about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and all that stuff, and it's as if no one ever told you, you know, we all have the experience of someone, maybe it's the older kid or your parents, like, okay, Santa isn't real. And it's as if no one ever comes along to say this belief about you not being enough that you've accepted as truth isn't the truth. And so I know with the work that we did, like you just see that that is this thing you believe in so much that it isn't even a belief. It is just fact for you. And there's no one there really telling you otherwise. And you kind of live your life that way. Does that align with what you're saying? Exactly. I mean, if I ask you, you know, roses are red and violets are blue, blue, they're actually purple. But because we heard at some point in our life that they were blue, Mm -hmm. we just accepted that as a truth. And for the rest of our lives, violets are blue, even though they're really not. So what I really want, you know, to help people that I work with to really understand is that these core beliefs, when they're formed, when we're young, they're seed beliefs. Once they're formed, once we've accepted it as a truth, it becomes a solid core belief. It doesn't change. But when we get older, we don't ever go back and reassess. When I think about this event in my life, is that belief, is it still a truth today? Because today your brain has much more experience. You're older, you've got more resources, more knowledge. You have so much more information in your brain to help you determine if, you know, what the belief is according to that event that happened. But we never go back and reassess it. We just accept all the core beliefs that we've already formed as truth. And we go on the rest of our lives. And what's really scary about that, James, is that, you know, you figure 95 percent of all of our actions, all of our feelings and our behaviors come from our subconscious mind. Mm. That's where all our core beliefs sit. But how many people know what's in their subconscious mind? I don't know about you, but if 95% of my life is being guided by what's in this, you know, this dark, deep web place, I want to know what's in there. If that's what's designing and determining my future. Well, and you know, it's funny because this reminds me of a personal development conference I attended a couple of years ago where there was an assignment in the room to like write down all your limiting beliefs. <laughs> and that was like the hardest thing in the world for me to do because I, I was like, boy, if I knew what they were, they, w- <laughs> they wouldn't be there. And so I think that was also a huge piece of this is is through the process like you that you offer, you're really discovering what those beliefs are. I don't, does that make sense? Like, I don't really feel like we walk around saying most people that like, Oh yeah, this is just a belief in my subconscious. Like it's hidden from us. Right. Oh, absolutely. We don't, most of us don't walk around saying I'm unworthy or I'm worthless. We don't do that. We're for the most part, we stay positive and 
we're just not aware of those core beliefs. But you know what is a core belief by simply doing, you know, a little exercise, which is core beliefs sound like, you know, they're always an I or I am for the most part. You know, there's control beliefs, there's value beliefs, there's safety beliefs, responsibility beliefs, you know, I should have known better, should have done something, I'm not in control, etc. And there's a difference, obviously, between what we know to be true and what feels true. So if you take any core belief, if you take any negative core belief, or you could even take a positive, let's say I am in control. You know you're in control, but when you say that, does it feel true? If you take a belief, I am good enough, you know that that's true logically, but does it feel true? Are there times where it doesn't feel true? You can swap it around and take the negative. If you take a belief, I'm insignificant or I'm incapable, does that feel true to you or do you know it to be true? So anything that feels true, true when you say these core beliefs that's a core belief Got because it. Yeah. we stamp our beliefs by what we feel there's no such thing as a feeling that's not attached to a belief and it's so interesting too because in work that phoebe and i have both done we've learned about things uh, people like running that belief of i'm not good enough is that being one of the quote unquote popular core mm-hmm. beliefs that a lot of us have. And so we both have had affirmations and, you know, I have it as the screensaver on my phone of I am enough. And it was just so funny to like, cause what you're saying, it just resonates so much with me that there's like today in this present moment as who I am, like there's this conceptual knowing of if I, Hey, I keep saying that I'm enough, I'm enough. Like, yeah, I got that. And you're right. It feels like there is this blind spot or unknowing when it comes to your subconscious. So what you're saying is that the feeling will be really the indicator as to how much you really believe that. Exactly. And then, you know, that starts to leak into, you know, the self states and the mind, but yeah, you know, it's just really easy to assess if it feels true. It's a core belief. And that's a really good way to, you know, just identify, just to know, just make a list, you know, go down, a list, you can Google core beliefs or cognitions, you know, you can Google that and it'll give you a list, go down the list of all the positive cognitions and determine which ones feel true and which ones don't and make a list. And that's your map. Mm. That's your map because the way your brain works is whatever core beliefs you hold, your brain has to align your life to fit your core beliefs. So, you know, you can see how intense and important that is to know. Can I just ask there, because I I just want, I'm so fascinated by all this. So, you know, and I so see that your life aligns to these core beliefs that the brain needs to make the congruency there. Do you have just some specific examples of what that looks like where someone, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of running from this belief of, I'm not enough versus someone who maybe doesn't have that belief. Like where does it branch off or veer? How does that show up in someone's life? I guess. Right. Well, a lot of, you know, I have, you know, one of the major things I do is help people get unstuck. I've got an unstuck program. You'll see that on my website. And what keeps us stuck is whatever core beliefs that we hold in our subconscious mind, it creates a guideline. So You take it, let's say, for example, and I'll answer your question, but you take, for example, a robot. If you program a robot to wash the dishes, make the bed and vacuum the floor, the robot will never wash your car. And we're the same way. Our core beliefs create a guideline to what's possible. So let's say, you know, someone has a core belief, I'm incapable, which was formed, you know, at some point in their life. It's how they made sense of something. It probably wasn't a truth, but it was formed nonetheless, accepted as a truth. So for someone who's got a belief, I'm incapable or I can't do it or I'm not good enough, they're going to struggle in their business. They're never going to get past this wall, this breaking point, this tipping point we hear about. Mm. For someone who's got a belief, I'm unlovable or I don't deserve or I'm unworthy. In their relationships, they're always going to struggle 
because their brain, their psyche, because that's a core belief, it's not going to allow them to ever fully connect with that person. It won't let them because it won't be a truth. Yeah. Does that make sense? It, mm-hmm. it does. And I'm just like freaking out about this because like I look mm-hmm. at my journey and I see where I was really stuck and I see how like there were opportunities and lessons in my life where I was blessed enough to break through that without doing the you know, work with you. And then of course I see in five days how much of a difference it made. Like what, is there anything else people can do if they're not doing a lot of these processes that we'll, you know, get into. And I know we'll talk about self states in a moment, but like, I mean, I don't want to be like doomsday here, but are people kind of doomed if they have that core belief and they want to go out and do that life changing thing? Are they stuck? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And and that's the be- that's where all my passion comes in, you know, because therapy happens in the world, not just in session. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot that we can do. But what I find is unlike yourself, but you will notice in the very beginning when we started working together, you'll notice that you somewhat knew about your past and your history. But then again, you kind of didn't. You know, and and we have this the ego, which is also our mind. It's got five million names. <laughs> it resists this process. It resists looking at our past. It resists anything. I mean, our brain is not programmed to challenge us to grow. It's programmed to help us survive. So anything we do that is uncomfortable or brings up any feeling whatsoever it's going to resist against. And that's why most people have learned how to survive, but very few people have ever learned how to live. And so it's getting past that resistance, you know, and I really, you know, I studied, you know, research that, you know, resistance, because it happens, you know, in session all the time. So I expect it. And I know that it's usually an unconscious resistance that's happening. But it's if you think of a mirage, we all have these illusions that we create. And we create these illusions such as I can avoid disappointments if I don't take a risk, if I don't put myself out there, or I can avoid losing people or this person in my life if I act or do these certain things. And the truth is, is that, you know, that's a complete illusion. It's a distortion. We can't control those things, whether we take risks or not, disappointments are going to happen. They're part of life, whether we, you know, bend over backwards for somebody or not. You know, if they decide to leave, they're going to leave. But it's too painful for us to do that. So we create these illusions. And that's part of the resistance of, you know, facing reality. Remember, this all starts with reality for me is we create these illusions that are much more like a mirage, you know. And so if you're in the desert and you haven't had water for 10 days, you're going to want to see that body of water up ahead. And you're going to hold to that illusion because that illusion, that mirage is what's giving you hope. And it's what's helping you to survive. Mm. And once we get a foothold on survival, which means, okay, I figured out how to live life. I figured out how to do this. I figured out how to have friends. I figured out how to do life under the circumstances regardless of any feelings, regardless of any history, regardless of any thoughts, I figured it out. And people are very fearful to lose that, to gamble that. They're afraid to lose the only foothold that they have, even if it means getting or attaining something better. Did that answer your question or did I go off? To no, it? and it's so good. The first thing is it reminds me of the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Mm-hmm. Classic book. But also you asked me this question you know, how did you survive? Or you asked me to ask myself this question and kind of ponder it. And we shared this on the episode 71, that it was very clear for me that the way I survived was to be invisible, to be unseen, to, you know, and that I think today is part of why I get so passionate about the kind of conversations we have, because the amount of stuff I had, like, there's just a walking, talking contradiction between the person who wants to have a personal brand and reach people all over the world from the internet, who also wants to be invisible. So the amount of work I've had to do, you know, it's been a bumpy journey. And I look at how for so many years, I just, nothing was working. And there was that stuckness that you talk about. So this is just so powerful. 
So amazing. And I see, you know, I see it with a lot of our students and customers when we talk to them about launching their business or getting their first product or offer out there to the world. There is that illusion that we have that I'll launch or I'll promote it or I'll do my first webinar once I've got all this other stuff figured out, all the ducks in the row so that I can avoid the frustration, the disappointment, the failure. Mm -hmm. And that was a really huge thing I picked up from you is, you know, do you want to survive by trying to avoid all these things or just like the way I took it is just play full out knowing that these things are unavoidable. And it's really about how you show up in those moments to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And we did this training right on the front end of a, a live event, which was, by the way, just an update for you, was an extraordinary event. And we did another episode talking about this and we made an offer at the event. And, you know, there, yes, there's like resistance. It always comes up like, oh, you're going to go on stage and pitch something. And we, you know, adopted the philosophy, the Silicon Valley philosophy, fail fast, fail often and fail forward. And, you know, did the offer anyways. And we ended up, you know, attracting half of the members in the room to join this program. You know, I could have very easily have done the safe cop out and say, oh, maybe I'm not ready to do this. Uh, maybe I won't do it this time. Mm -hmm. And it's just I think life is about you really live when you take those things head on. I, you know, I just I don't know. There's just. Uh, I yeah, well, I, first of all, that I think that's I love that you had such an amazing event because I wondered I knew it would be amazing. But I thought I wonder how that ex this experience doing this intensive. I wonder how that's going to liven us up. And, you know, the whole thing with living versus surviving is most people do want to live. First of all, most people think they are living. Um, but, you know, the whole thing with living is we have to be able, in order to live, we have to be able to feel. And in order to feel, we have to be able to see the, the reality, to see our life, to see our entire history, our story. And most people are fearful of seeing everything. They might skim the top or they'll see just certain parts of their life, but they don't want to see all of it. And, you know, that resistance, I think this point in the conversation. So, you know, talking about core beliefs and understanding, you know, how they're working in our lives behind the scenes. That's about what I'm finding as far as we get with typical typical programs that are out there. I get a lot of clients that come from Landmark, which I didn't attend, but I've heard is an amazing experience, but they get about right here. And, mm -hmm. and same with a lot of these, a lot of some of the personal development programs, they get about right here. And this resistance is what it's so amazing, James, that there's many parts of our personalities. As I mentioned initially, when we start, you know, started this podcast as many states the resistance is a different state. So if we're not, if the person that's in the room at your event, if the part of them is that self state, they're going to resist. If they're in the part of them that's in the present, then they're not. I use this term called living in the memory. Most people are living in the memory and they're not aware that that's happening. When we're triggered, when we put our brain in an uncomfortable place where it feels like, okay, this is uncomfortable, we need to survive. When we put ourselves in there, we get triggered. And when we're triggered, we transition into a self state. And self states live in our subconscious mind. In essence, self states, they're just bundles of information, which make up a memory. But everything in that bundle of information in that memory, hold affect, thoughts, sensations, feelings, beliefs, everything that makes up one entire individual personality. So now we have all these little personalities in our subconscious mind. And when we're in an event, we hope that we're in the present. But most often people that are resistant or fearful, they're in their subconscious mind in one of those self states. And what's crazy is we don't notice that's happening. There's nothing to tell us that that's happened. And eventually when the threat goes away, we transition back into our conscious mind 
into the present state. Does that make sense? It does to me. And when you share, this is like one of the first things you shared with me on day one of our intensive is the distinction of these self states. And it took a little bit of time for me to really, really get it. But now looking back after five days, it blew my mind. It totally blew my mind. So Phoebe, does the concept of self states make sense so far? It does so far. I think I'm still a little bit fuzzy on it, but I've heard you kind of sprinkle it in a couple times throughout the episode. So I'm hoping to kind of learn a little bit more about it as we continue I, the conversation. I think for me, it was like, yes, the way you describe it, Dr. Michaela, is it's, it's this bundle of memories. And for me, it was like, these are versions of you that show up when you're triggered or upset and it's almost like, it's almost like they oh it's a program that overrides your default programming and then you kind of come back and you're like that wasn't really my best version of myself right there or I'm kind of ashamed of how I acted or what I said is that it is, it is. you know one way because here's where it gets tricky you know is you know I've had to over the years really try to you know, I'm a clinician, but I'm just a, you know, human being just like you. And I've had to really learn how to communicate these concepts in just a very general, real way to help people to understand. So oftentimes I'll ask, you know, ask a client, if I ask you if you love yourself 100%, would you say yes? Now, most of the time, you know, a person will say, well, I do, but I don't love this one part of me that gets really angry. I don't love this jealous part of me. And, you know, when they start naming those parts that they don't like, that's my in. Because the parts that we don't like, those are self-states. And I'll explain why, if you'd like for me to. Please. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So to simplify it as best I can, you take two circles. You know, on the left, you've got your conscious mind. On the right, you have your subconscious mind. The role of your conscious mind, that's when we're in the present, which most people think they are in. The role of the conscious mind is to look and appear normal in society at all times. Literally, it's what the literature says. So anytime we have a memory that is disturbing or where we felt inadequate or where we felt unacceptable or anything negative, well, that doesn't help the conscious mind, which is called the self, you know, when we say, well, I told myself, well, I thought to myself, we're really talking to the self. Well, if those memories do not help the self to present to the world and look and appear normal, what the self, the conscious part of our mind will do is it will push that memory into the subconscious mind. It's not helpful. It's not going to help us to look good. And those memories that go in the subconscious mind, we just go about our life and we think they're gone because we're not consciously aware of them. They're in our subconscious mind, but they're very much active in our life. Even though they're in our subconscious mind, they're active, you know, 95% of the time. But a lot of times we'll say things like, well, you know, I love myself. I just, I hate this one part of myself. That's the conscious part of our mind pushing that into the subconscious mind. Those parts, though, now those memories that are in our subconscious mind, each one of those memories was pushed down there because it was believed to be unacceptable, not good enough, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to forget about that. We want to push it away. And those are the parts that when we get triggered, those are the parts, the little personalities that we actually step into, which is why we struggle with feeling unworthy, which is why we have anxiety, which is why sometimes we feel certain ways and it doesn't fit the current situation. Why am I anxious right now? I shouldn't. Why am I afraid to do this? I don't know. Why did I act that way? I, it doesn't make sense because we're in those different parts of self. Does that make sense? It does. So that's kind of the default game that we're playing. What would you say is the truth? Like, what would you say is you know, because that's this illusion that we have to cover up, I guess, right? These things right. that we think are making us less than. What is the reality then if that's kind of, I guess, the game we're playing? Does that, does that make sense? Bottom line is that what we don't learn growing up is we don't learn that what defines us 
is simply the kind of person that you are and the choices that you make today. Mm. That's what we can't lose our worth. We can't lose our lovableness. We can't lose, you know, our safety. We can't, first of all, the world was never safe to begin with. We can't lose these things. But when things happen in our lives, this is all an unconscious process. When things happen in our lives, we feel like we've lost worth or we became not good enough or what have you. And because we thought that happened, we then grapple for the rest of our lives trying to become those things again. So the first experience we have is, you know, in grade school, when we are trying to feel accepted and if we don't have a core belief that we're already good enough or worthy or what have you, then the first time, you know, we get a, you know, we, we've got the good looking boyfriend or we start getting attention because of the clothes we're wearing or we get down to a certain weight. We just assume, ah, okay, this, this is how I'm good enough again. This is how I'm going to be worthy again. Or we get good grades. Oh, these accomplishments or my intelligence, that makes me valuable. And now we've been set down this path for the rest of our lives, really being held hostage to maintaining these accomplishments so we maintain being worthy, maintaining this unrealistic weight to continue to be valuable and worthy. And that's where we're clutching and white knuckling life because if your worth is on the line, then I can see why people stress out so much about, you know, these things happening. And the truth of the matter is, is what we don't, we didn't learn. What we don't know is that we never lost our worth. Mm -hmm. We never lost our capabilities. We never lost those things. We just thought we did. And so we've had them all along. That's one of the foundations that I have to really help people understand when, when I begin the intensives is helping them understand, yes, I know that this is a new concept. I know I'm asking you to believe something brand new, but society does not define our truths. What defines us is the kind of person we are. Nobody can make you unworthy. And nobody can make you these things, but all of this is unconsciously happening outside of our awareness all throughout our life and forming those violets that are purple that aren't really purple. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So now how you've talked about the self states and I understand that. And I went to, you know, I had a session recently with someone and we talked, you know, about similar things. And so my question to you is how do you begin the healing process of these self states? What does that look like? You know, step number one is helping people to accept this reality that we have self states. And that's a difficult, you know, because I'm all about helping people understand we cannot just trust our perception at all. I mean, this is what I work with every day is, you know, people come in and they have all these distortions and they know logically it's not true, but they still feel this way, et cetera, et cetera. We can't trust our perception because we're oftentimes in our memory network. We're oftentimes in our subconscious mind, same thing. And, you know, it's no different than when I try to help people understand about their perception, because that's a tough one. It's like me saying, listen, I know you just met me, but I, I want you as best as you can to trust me that the reality that you're seeing, it's not real. <laughs> and that's a really tough sell. But it's no different than if you think, and this was a TED, I just recently did a TED talk, and this was the talk that I gave. If you think about a dream, when you're in a dream, that reality and the way you see your life and yourself and the people in the dream in the dream, you would never question whether it was real or not. While you're in the dream, that reality is the only reality that is. It isn't until you wake up that you realize, oh, wow, that was just a dream. I can't believe it. Well, it's the same thing in real life. When we talk about state of mind and these states, we're either in the present state, we're in the memory state, or we're in the dream state. And when we're in the memory state, which most people are living in the memory, we're accepting our reality just as much as we would if we were in a dream and accepting that reality. It is a tough sell 
to help someone to believe and see. And that's why I try to use that analogy, because there is no reason to challenge what we know. There really isn't a reason for someone to say, well, you know, what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing, why should I believe it's not true? It feels true. It's what I know. It's true. But the reason why we have to always question our perception, always stalk our perception and always be really mindful of, you know, is what I'm thinking a truth? Is what I'm feeling the truth? You know, be really you know, gain that self-awareness is because if we don't do that, then we're going to simply accept that if we're in the memory network, if we're in the past, in other words, if we got triggered and we're in one of these self states, we're seeing the present circumstance through the eyes of that past part of us who's still living in the past. Does that make sense? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's like this memory state is basically just a filter in exactly. uh, the lens through which we see a distorted version. So it's like, what does life look like through the eyes of I'm not enough? Exactly. Wow. Uh, remember those memories, they get stuck, you know, and that's where EMDR comes in. That's where it really is helpful. Those memories that get shoved down in the subconscious and they're only the emotional, upsetting, the negative, they're only the ones that are deemed bad or unhelpful. And when those memories get stuck in the, or get pushed into the subconscious, they're stuck in time. So we continue reliving them every time we're triggered. Does that make sense? And that's what EMDR does is you take a memory. So you think of it as a file. It's got all this information in it. The file gets stuck. So when we're you know, all throughout our life, when we're in REM sleep mode and we're dreaming, your brain is processing all the information that happened throughout the day to come up with a conclusion. What does it say about me? But when we're young or at any age in our life, if we don't have enough information, then the brain isn't able to process or come up with a conclusion. It just kind of stays idle, that memory. And so what EMDR does is it puts the person in the same state of mind, you're wide awake. It's the opposite of hypnosis. You're not in a trance-like state. You're wide awake, but you're in the same state as REM sleep mode to now reprocess, which means pull up this memory associated to this belief. And we only use the memory because if you've got a belief that feels true, even though you know it's not, where might you have learned it? So we've got to go back to the source. And EMDR processes that memory from today as an adult. So it just basically dislodges that file because your brain will process it for you, which is what makes EMDR so easy. It's free processing. You're not coming in and trying to figure out or solve a problem. You know, that's, it gives people too much anxiety. Your brain will do that on its own. We just have to get it back in that state and get you back in that file to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for, so when you do go back to these memories, is the goal of the memory to remember it in a different way? Or is it to just notice the truth, you know, to be able to pull out the truth or is it to change it? Like what is the goal of bringing up those specific memories? Well, the goal is, you know, we go back to that foundation of, okay, what defines us, our truths again, you know, and that's why it's really important for people to be able to identify you know, if this is true, if you're telling me this is true, where do you pull your truths from? You know, and that's why it's really helpful, you know, for those who do have a spiritual background of some sort, because we don't want to be defining our own truth because we don't know which part of us is defining it. And we don't want society to be defining our truths. So we have to know, we have to have that foundation of what are our truths and what defines us can never be anything external. You know, so if for a lot of people, I'll take them and cross your fingers so I don't forget that last question. For a lot of people, I'll, I'll have them stand in the middle of my office and I'll say, okay, if, if I have you stand in the middle of my office, I take a piece of chalk and I draw it around you, what would you put in that circle with you that's evidence of your worth, of your value, or that makes you good enough or capable? And most people would put in my kids or my accomplishments or my friends or the things I own, or my success. Well, if that's the case, if I take all of those things out of the circle, are you then unworthy and not good enough and not valuable? So we have to get back to always that foundation. That's a critical piece 
before you can even begin EMDR, before you can do any work in general in this way. But the goal is, to answer your question, we're focusing on the core belief. So your question was specifically when we pull up these memories, is it to... Yeah. So just when you pull up the memories, are you trying to kind of reframe the memory? Are you trying to change it? Are you trying to just notice and pull the truth out from that, looking back as, you know, the present being, the present you? Yeah. The goal is to, for the person to reprocess that belief. So what that means is, as long as there's a part of them that understands the logic, not even the logic, the truth about what defines us. I don't need them to feel like it's true. And I don't need all of them to believe it. But I do need some part of them to understand that that is a truth. And that's all. Because the goal is now to pull up the memory from today and reprocess it. And I'll explain kind of, you know, these how EMDR works with the movements, bilateral movements. But to determine if I'm in the fourth grade, and I'm not invited to the birthday party and everybody else is. And because of that memory, I felt not good enough. And I've always now as an adult, I've always felt that not good enough. Even though I have friends, I still am self-conscious and I still lack confidence because it's that not good enough. So the goal is to go back, where did you learn it? And determine where that is. And then process that with bilateral movements with free processing, is I'm not good enough a truth when you think about that event today? Or is there a more truthful meaning to it? Is there a more truthful definition? And the truth is, let's say if you didn't get invited, whether you got invited or not, nothing can make us something. And nobody can make us something. What it means is not that you're not good enough. What it means is you didn't get invited and that sucks. And, you know, hopefully you'll be invited to the next event and et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't make us not good enough. And, you know, I think we kind of support these negative beliefs just by simply not knowing when, you know, when something bad happens to our kids as they're growing up, you know, we might say, listen, Johnny, I'm sorry you didn't make the team. It doesn't mean that you're not you know, capable or you're not strong enough doesn't mean you're not a good or it doesn't mean these things. But what we don't do is when good things happen, we forget to say, hey, Johnny, I know, you know, I know you got invited or I know you, you know, you hit that home run, but that didn't make you good enough. You were good enough before that happened. Mm. So it's really establishing what defines us. So EMDR in essence uses bilateral movements. I'll pull that in but only until all of this foundation, James, you remember, all of this foundation has to be yeah. laid down first. And one thing you kept repeating to me, especially because I'm a very logical person, is, James, this stuff isn't going to be logical. It's not going to make sense. And, you know, it did and it didn't. There were, I guess, the way my experience of the EMDR process was is that it was, you know, because I had a real fear and concern. And as I've shared with others, my experience, and they want to do it, they've had the same concern, like, oh, my gosh, what if I get in there, and I don't remember any of these Mm -hmm. memories? And what if I can't, I don't have a very, I don't even know what I had for breakfast this morning. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like my experience was is that the EMDR was like this door or gateway that opened from the conscious brain straight into the subconscious and like things just kind of popped in front of me and just like flooded forward and I'm just it's just like you don't go and sit down in a movie theater and say like what if I don't remember what's going to come up on that screen like and that's that was the experience for me as I was just sitting in a movie theater watching these memories come forward and I just kind of had to relax that was just unbelievable and 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 you were right like it wasn't logical like a memory would come up and I was like where where that come from But at the same time, you really start to gain a deeper understanding of everything that's going on and speaking to the healing part, or at least for me, yes, to be able to re-experience something that happened at a young age with what you set as the foundation allowed for a new meaning, allowed for new context for me. I just thought that was powerful. Can you share, James, do you feel comfortable sharing anything that came up for you in that that we can... Well, I think, yeah, I I mean, I think what I brought up a little bit last week, just the short version, is that there was just, there was, you know, definitely like the 
I'm trying to remember the exact core beliefs, but definitely, you know, they're not good enough and they're not Mm -hmm. worthy. And I just remember a lot of memories of, and meanings and survival mechanisms that I created about being invisible because of, I grew up in a very small town that is very image focused oriented town, you know, Mm -hmm. Laguna Beach, California. And my parents were very visible in their line of work and being in real estate and stuff. And so like reputation became so much and my parents were more concerned about what people thought of us than anything else. And so that was, that became a lot of my filter of how I behaved. It was like, okay, well, I just won't, I'll just be invisible. I'll just be quiet. I won't. I just thought it was such a big, it it just became so apparent to me how important I had made others opinions and the exact opposite of what Dr. Michaela has been saying is like society doesn't define you. And it was like, I saw an environment where it absolutely did. Mm -hmm. And you just see how much that affects you. And yeah, just to kind of go back to that, it was, was like just transformational. So was there, was, was there like one specific moment that you went back to, or was it like, Oh, I remember this makes sense. And you're kind of putting, there are, there were, there are specific, absolutely. There are specific moments. And there were other times too, where Dr. Michaela is guiding you. And I was like, Oh, there's kind of like a general timeline Mm -hmm. of like this, but then there were like, wow, this is a very specific moment. And you're replaying it, you know, over and over again, you're like reliving it. And I saw it and it was like clear as day. And it was something that I really hadn't thought of. So it was like, but then it just became, and then through the EMDR, like it's like a thread, right? It's just now you're jumping to another and another and another. And it was like, oh my goodness. Like I didn't even know I had a memory of this still, Mm -hmm. which was just such a bizarre, but beautiful experience for me. So, and then Dr. Michaela, do you help facilitate the, like the healing process? Are you like pulling from all these memories and asking probing questions? Like what is your role in all of this as he's, you know, pulling up all these memories. It's huge, which is why these intensives are intense for both of us. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, I'll answer that, James. Wasn't it amazing when you think back that the only resistance you had was a result of the beliefs that you were holding? Mm-hmm. So, you know, having to look back for a lot of us on our past, especially when we're very positive people, we're very, you know, or we're type A, we don't want to think about the negatives. We don't want to think about that. There's a resistance there and there's a reason for that. But if we have a belief of, let's say, I don't want to be wrong or I can't, a blocking belief such as that, then we're not going to be able to even look at our past. We're not even going to be able to move beyond that. And we can have these blocking beliefs, but here's the role that I play. And here's how cell states came in. Here's why I needed to really study the psyche is when we start doing EMDR. And again, we don't have to have any memories. A lot of people don't have memories. You know, you can you're really focusing on the negative belief and it doesn't matter if it's a thought, an emotion. It's wherever that belief sits. For some people, they'll say, well, I have this feeling which is, you know, anxiety And the belief that comes up is I can't protect myself. And then I'll ask, well, when you notice that anxiety and that belief, just what's the image that comes up in your mind? So it can be a made up image. Doesn't matter. That's what your mind's holding. But when we start doing EMDR, it uses a bilateral movement. So this is towards, you know, we start getting into the work now, now that the foundation is there and a part of them understands these truths The bilateral movement, what it does is you can use eye movements, you can use pulses, you can use audio. But what it's doing is you're holding together a belief where you might have learned it, the image or the picture or the memory, the emotion, how disturbing it feels when you think about it. And you're watching, for me, you're watching um, light go back and forth. And again, it can be any bilateral movement. And then you're just thinking about it. That's all. You're just daydreaming about it. That's where you're in REM sleep mode. And we do this in sets. And as you're just daydreaming from there, I'll stop the lights and I'll ask, what do you notice? And the client will then report anything that came up. I noticed a part of this memory came up, or I noticed this thought, or I noticed what I had for lunch for yesterday, or I noticed what have you. And they'll say, well, did that make sense? And I'll say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to, but yes, it did. Just notice that. And we go back into the sets. But when they're reporting to me in between those sets, when I ask them, what do you notice? 
I'm getting from time to time the present part of the self state, the person you are when you're in your logical part of your brain, when you're in the present. And other times when they're reporting, I'm getting one of the self states that's reporting. So the whole goal of the back and forth light, the back and forth movement is to tap onto your present and also tap onto your past. So we're really opening up the conscious and subconscious mind so that I can hear from all the different parts of that person. And the ultimate goal is open up communication between the conscious and subconscious mind. We spend a lot of time trying to get into the present. You know, we spend a lot of time meditating. And if we're trying to get in the present, where do you think you are now? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're in the memory. And the whole goal is to open up that communication between the two. And what really was a pivotal defining change, another change in this process was about, oh, I don't know, three years ago, I started working with a client who was very dissociative, highly dissociative. And now I specialize in dissociative disorder. And when they get triggered and they do EMDR, depending on how integrated the conscious and subconscious mind is, because there's usually a wall, right? Because those parts in the subconscious mind, they're those are the not good enoughs and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a wall. But depending on the level of trauma we have, that wall can be really thick. So when we get triggered, typically for someone who didn't grow up with trauma, we've got one foot in the past and one foot in the present. So we can feel anxious or we can feel a certain way, but we never lose sight of the present. But for somebody who's got a lot of trauma and a lot of times entrepreneurs, you know, people who come in and just think, I just want to build my confidence. They might find that there's some trauma or small T traumas. But for someone with a lot of trauma, what I noticed is when they transition into one of these parts, they've got both feet in the past. So my office will become, let's say, you know, their bedroom, their childhood bedroom, and I may become their aunt, their uncle, their mom. And that's their reality in that moment. And I have to pull them back into the present. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, you know, if our mind has the ability to pull us this far into our memory network, and we can lose sight of reality to that extent, then are we all dissociating on some level? Maybe not to this extent. And that's why I started hearing clients say, you know, the most intelligent, self-sufficient individual will come in. And even though I'll explain to them the logic, the truth, whether you do this or not, disappointments are going to happen, as example. They logically will understand and believe me, but they won't walk out the door and change anything. And that's because that part of them, that self-state, doesn't believe it. And they want to hold on to that, you know, that illusion. But the role is very important to answer your question, long-winded. The role is very important is because if that relationship isn't there, if that education isn't there, if that person doesn't understand what's going on, those parts will not come out. And I'll just get that present part of the adult reporting to me and going through the whole process. Those self states have to be in the room. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Yeah. And obviously hearing this after experiencing it, let's just like, it's so cool to hear another layer of the work that you're doing because you were a guide for me. You were a mirror for me and you were just always asking extraordinary questions that just kind of throw it back on me. Oh, it was just so unbelievable. So Dr. Michaela, this has been extraordinary and I just have to thank you so much for sharing and giving so much on this episode, for taking so much out of your busy schedule, for being here. You know, the only other bigger testimonial that I could give is to share my wife's testimonial uh, about, you know, the whole new version of me as we've been talking to our friends and family. She says, you know, James is, is another person. It's been such a gift to her. And I know she is excited to work with you as well, just because she's simply just seen the transformation that I've gone through. And I really want to encourage our listeners to get a dose of Dr. Michaela's gift. And I'm going through one of your online courses now. So please, where can we learn more about you? Where can we 
actually dive into this work because guys, if you're here and you're listening, this is the work and it is so important. It is absolutely essential, especially in the world of entrepreneurship, the amount of stuff that we have to do and go through and the emotional roller coaster to not have this, it just, I feel like it's going to be what my journey was, which was a lot of years of struggle with very little progress. And I feel like I'm going into warp speed overdrive. So where can we get started? Well, my website is drmichaela.com. And if you go there, you can read about the intensives that I do. You can also look at the online programs that I do. And again, all of them include all of this. So the self states, the brain, you know, it, helping people to understand that the brain and the psyche, they're not the same thing. And there's a funnel, there's your brain, there's your psyche, and then there's you. But all of the programs and mainly in session teaches people, okay, now that we have this information, how do we, what do we do? How do we change these things? Like what are the actual exercises? And we don't have to delve into, you know, our past or all these, you know, really upsetting things. And, you know, it was trying to figure out how can I create a way for people to make these changes, people who can't afford to go to therapy or don't have the time or don't want to delve into their past. How can I do this ethically? And it was really just creating these certain techniques, a formula, if you will, to now take everything that we've talked about in this podcast and do these specific exercises when you get triggered, when you feel anxiety, when you notice this. And the goal is to really gain an amazing sense, a deeper sense of awareness. And, and that's really the key is if you know what's happening, that's, you know, three fourths of the battle, the, oh. the, you know, the techniques and the formula that just, you know, closes it all up in a nice, neat bundle. I'm going to link up the URL, drmichaela.com in the show notes. Guys, there's no affiliate link or anything. We just, I have the biggest endorsement ever from just my own personal experience with Dr. Michaela. I'm going through in session myself right now. And it's just, it's so awesome that I get her virtual as well. So I just cannot recommend it enough. Once again, that's Dr. Michaela. Dot com. Go grab one of her courses. This stuff is so absolutely essential. And if you can lock her down for one of these five day intensives, she's out in Southern California, really close to me. That was something that was super convenient. I got an Uber to just take me out there every day and it was like a <laughs> 10 minute drive. And I know people have flown in from all over the country and probably the world to do these intensives with you. So again, thank you so much. Now, as we wrap up, I think my last question for you is really just to see if you have any parting words or last message to share for our listeners in order to call this episode complete. Yeah. You know, thank you for that. You know, the, la you know, the last thing is it's always like if this one moment is the last moment I have with this person, what can I tell them to really help them the most? And that is to you know, that saying out of sight, out of mind, it should be out of sight, out of mind and running your life. Always stalk your perception. Don't just take verbatim that what you see or what you think don't don't just accept that it's real or it's the truth. Always investigate. Never stop asking why. Never stop wondering and just stay in your journey. We're only in one of two places. We're either in survival mode or we're on the journey that lasts a lifetime. And when you're on the journey, you're living. And this is something that anybody can do on their own. It doesn't matter what your history is. It doesn't matter if you've had trauma, no trauma. This is something that everybody can do. For me, it's the biggest gift to be able to. This is how I make sense of my own life, my own past, and to be able to kind of create these things for people to use. So thank you for having me on today. It was, you know, it was an honor working with you mm. and an honor being interviewed as well by you, James. Oh, absolutely. And yes, of course, thank you. And you truly do have an extraordinary gift. And it is just such an honor <laughs> to, I mean, it's just been such a desire to get that gift in front of our listeners. So thank you. And thank you to our listeners. This was a longer episode, but I just think it was so amazing. So thank you for tuning in. I'm James Wedmore. I'm Phoebe Mrochek. And we'll see you on the next episode. Are you frustrated that no matter how hard you hustle, no matter how much you get done in a day, 
you still feel like you have a little results to show for it? Do you feel like you're doing everything right, but there's still something missing? Well, what if there was an easier way? What if your business could be fun, effortless, and profitable. Phoebe and I have put together a free audio MP3 for you, compiling the 77 business affirmations for creating success from the inside out. And we want to give it to you absolutely free. This is your chance to rewire your brain for bigger results in your life and your business. To get instant access absolutely free, simply visit 77affirmations.com. That's the number 77affirmations.com.